So recently, I want to re- remember something with you guys tonight. Recently, my wife and my kids, we visited my in-law's house. And as we were leaving, um, I noticed that there was a bug sitting on the passenger window of our vehicle. And as we left Cocoa, Florida, I said to him, man, you are in for one ride. <laughs> and as I got onto the highway and got up to about 50, 60 miles an hour, I said to myself, is he going to make it? I mean, is he going to pers- right? This has happened to you guys as well, right? You're looking at this poor bug on the window wondering, is he going to persevere to the end? Does he got what it takes to endure through the wind beating down upon him as the road gets rough and bumpy? Will he fall away or does he have what it takes to, to overcome? Well, I I figured my wife was probably wondering why I kept taking my eyes off of the road and looking out the window. And so I said, babe, look at this, look at him. You think think he's gonna make it? And let's just say she didn't have like the same thrill and excitement, (laughs) right? Because from her perspective, all she saw was a little black dot on the window. But for me, I could see the struggle. I could see the fight. You know, there were times when this bug's little legs were just trembling and shaking. He could barely hold on. And then there were other times where he was as solid as a rock. He would not be moved. At other times I would look and it seemed like he had slid back from the position that he first held. And so in my mind, I I just just couldn't get it off. I couldn't get it out of my mind because it kept reminding me of the Christian faith. The Christian faith, right? Well, as we got into town, I looked over once again, and to my dismay, he was gone. He fell away. He didn't have what it took to persevere. Now, think about that for one moment. The first thing that I said to myself was, praise God, my rock, my refuge, the one in whom I put my trust, because we, that is God's people, will not be like some poor creeping thing on the window of this way. No, God's people will make it to the end. God's people will be guarded all the way to glory. Amen. Every undeserving sinner who God has in his love elected and sent his son into the world to pay the price, the ransom price, to deliver them from the bondage of their sin and from the wrath to come. And every undeserving sinner who has been born again and given the down payment of the Holy Spirit will never fully nor finally fall away, but they will indeed endure to the end because of the promise of God, the power of God, the efficacy of the work of Jesus Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit, they will endure to the end and be saved. All of God's people will be guarded to glory. So tonight I want you to consider with me three points. One, the author of our preservation. Two, the nature of our preservation. And three, the means of our preservation. And as we get started, Peter here in his first epistle is writing to persecuted Christians scattered, out, scattered throughout Asia Minor. Now, real surprising, huh? Like as I was thinking about the recipients of the letter, I said there is no other type of Christian. There is no other type of Christian except for a persecuted Christian, a Christian who is going through trials, a Christian who is going through tribulations. Why do we get caught off guard so often? Why do we think it's strange that we are ill-spoken of or persecuted in this, home, in this place? This place is not our home. We are pilgrims. This is not our home. Beware, brethren, lest the world love you. Right? Remember the words of the Apostle Paul. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. And so what Peter does right off the bat, they, these are dispersed Christians, persecuted. They have been dispossessed. Dispossessed of their properties. Dispossessed of their position in society. Dispossessed of their families. Dispossessed of their earthly inheritances. And what he does is he doesn't come in and start talking about their present circumstance. Isn't there such a, a temptation to 
be preoccupied with your circumstance, right? And then there becomes a great temptation to be despairing or to grow weary. Listen, as we go through trials and tribulations, believe me, I know there is a, a great temptation to fall into worry or to grow weary in doing good. And beloved, we are either going to grow or we are going to grumble. When we go through trials, we are going to grow or we are going to grumble. And Peter is concerned with the growth of his Christian brothers and sisters. And so first thing he does is he sets out to get pilgrim eyes off of present circumstances. And how does he do that? Well, he does that with a call to worship. Look in verse three. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he does to get their minds off of their present circumstances, circumstances, their present trials, is he calls them to worship God, to worship God specifically for his great salvation. Peter is calling the recipients of his letter and us through them to praise God in the midst of the storm. Praise him for his great salvation. Let us praise the great God of our salvation and let us praise God for the salvation that is oh so great. Blessed be God. This is um, a speaking well of God. It comes from the word eulagetos. It's where we get the word eulogy. It's a call to praise, a call to worship, a hymn of praise to God. In this passage, he is calling pilgrims to praise the God of their great salvation and rejoice in the salvation of their great God. Praising God for his infinite mercy is, is medicine to the weary soul. Medicine to the weary soul. Take notice of the, the chronological construction here. We'll just read through the text. Verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. He has begotten us again. So past tense, we have a past tense reality, a present tense reality, and a future reality that Peter is calling them to fix their eyes upon. Past tense, he has begotten us again. Present tense in verse five, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. Now that salvation is future tense. It is ready to be revealed in the last time. Tonight, we're going to be focusing most, most of our time on verse five, on verse five. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. If you have been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit as he has reached through the gospel and drawn you to Christ, then he has begotten you again to a living hope or a, the King James says a lively hope. What it, it's a hope of life. He, you have been begotten again to and a, a hope of eternal life. And it says you have been begotten again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. That inheritance is what is spoken of in verse five, the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And you might say, which the people who Peter was speaking to might have said, well, it's of little comfort for a man who is working his way across a raging ocean, being beaten down by the wind and the dark tempest. It's of little comfort to him to know that his treasure is safe and secure at his destination, right? What you would be most concerned about is will I make it to my inheritance, right? It's of little comfort for us to know that something is kept for us when we're not quite sure if we're gonna make it to that inheritance. But Peter hushes them, reinforces to them not, that not only is the inheritance being kept for them in heaven, but they are being kept for their inheritance. And that's where we pick up in verse five. It's reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God, 
kept by the power of God. I want you to consider the first point on your notes, the author of our preservation. The author of our preservation is given to us in explicitly in verse three, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is a, a Trinitarian designation when, when um, they would speak of God being the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it was emphasizing his place in the Godhead, that it's God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. He is none other than El Shaddai, God Almighty, the God of power, the powerful God. This word power is dunamis. It's where we get our English word dynamite. And instead of really speaking about um, doing something, it's, it emphasizes the ability to do something, the ability to carry out something. It's used in Hebrews 11.1 1, when Sarah is spoken of. She received power to conceive seed in her old age. Listen to what Stephen Charnock said about this power of God. The power of God is that ability and strength whereby he can bring to pass all that he pleases, whatsoever his infinite wisdom may direct and whatsoever the infinite purity of his will may resolve. As holiness is the beauty of all of God's attributes, so power is that which gives life and action to all the perfections of the divine nature. How vain would it be the eternal counsels if power did not step in to execute them. Without power, his mercy would be but feeble pity, his promises an empty sound, his threatenings a mere scarecrow. God's power is like himself, infinite, eternal, incomprehensible. It cannot be checked nor thwarted, restrained or frustrated by the creature. When they would speak of God's power, they would make a distinction between his power, his ordinate power and his absolute power. His ordinate power was his ability to bring, up, bring to pass all of his perfect will. But then you'd speak about his absolute power and that is his ability to do above and beyond even that which he ordains. Think about this. Remember the confession of John the Baptist in Luke 3.8. He said to these brood of vipers, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to ourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. That God can do more than he does. He is able to do even far beyond your comprehension. The power of God is immeasurable and incomprehensible. It's too great to calculate. It's far beyond our understanding. Listen to Job chapter 26, verse 5 through 14. The dead tremble. Those under the waters and those inhabiting them. Sheol is naked before him and destruction has no covering. He stretches out the north over the empty place. He hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the water in his thick clouds, and yet the clouds are not broken under it. He covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it. He drew a circular horizon on the face of the waters. At the boundary of light and darkness, the pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his rebuke. He stirs up the sea with his power and by his understanding, he breaks up the storms. By his spirit, he adorned the heavens. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Indeed, these are the mere edges of his ways. And how small a whisper we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or think. God is able to protect us from the schemes of Satan. God is able to protect us from the seduction of the world, the, the floods of sin and temptation that just seem to rush upon us and up out of us. God is able to keep us from the influence of error and false teaching. Turn in your Bibles to, to Jude. I want to show you. Um, the usage of dunamis in, in Jude, Jude verse 24. And you'll remember that Jude is all about 
these false teachers who have crept in unnoticed and that their destruction is sure. Well, when false teachers come into the church and affect, they, they affect the church. They affect people. And in verse, in verse 20, Jude starts to speak about our responsibility to those who have been affected by false teaching. In verse 20, it says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some, have compassion, making a, decision, making a distinction. But others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now, as as Jude exhorts us to go after people who have been affected by false teachers. And if you read Jude, those false teachers are divisive, headstrong, haughty. They, they pervert the truth. They twist the scriptures. In verse, in verse 20, we're to have mercy to the doubting. That is to, to those who have been confused by the false teacher's error. In verse 23, we are to snatch out of the fires those people, having mercy on them, those who have commended their ways, been affected. In verse 23, we're to have mercy with fear, hating the pollution. That is, we're to go after those who have been corrupted by the false teacher's lies. And what you might be concerned with is, well, what about me? I, I could get infected as well. If I go and start ministering to people with tuberculosis, am I not subject to that tuberculosis? No, believe me, brethren, it's no fool's errand to do something like that. You must be wise. You must beware. Um, like James said, restore. Store such a one with the spirit of, spirit of gentleness, but what? Beware, lest you also be overtaken. But here Jude gives an encouragement to the people not to fear, to handle your responsibility to those who have been, to God concerning those who have been overtaken, but not to fear, because look in verse 24. It says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. The reason why we should go after them out of love is because God has commanded us and we are to have this confidence that God is able to keep us from stumbling. That word able is dunamis, he is ability. And it is to keep us from stumbling. The word stumbling is the word for apostasy. God is able to keep us from apostasy and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. He is able to keep us. He is able to keep us. God's people will be guarded all the way to glory. Point two on your notes, the nature of our preservation. Turn back to 1 Peter chapter 3, I mean chapter 1. The nature of our preservation. I want you to consider anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriend thee. It says that we are being kept, in verse 5, you who are kept by the power of God. The ability of God is doing something. It is active. God Almighty is active in the preservation of the saints. In the New King James, it's rendered, you are kept. I like the way that the ESV words it because it, it brings out the, the tense, uh, the voice, the person. Um, in the ESV, it says, um, are being guarded, right? That means the saint is being guarded. They are passive in the fact that they are being guarded. God is active. God is the one guarding. This word kept or are being guarded in the ESV is a military term. It's through, through reo. And it's used to speak of the function of a fortress, a military base, a military garrison. The purpose of a garrison was to guard, protect, or keep secure, to preserve. The word is used in 2 Corinthians 11 
32 and 33, as Paul is speaking, he says in Damascus, the governor under Eretus, the king, was guarding, there's our word, was guarding the city of Damascenes with a garrison, desiring to arrest me, but I was let down in a basket through a window. Just as a stronghold would protect and guard the inhabitants of a city from enemies on the outside who would seek to assail or destroy, God is protecting as a garrison God's people from enemies not only on the outside but our great enemy, our own flesh on the inside. Listen, even the Mr. Fearings among us, those who struggle with the fear, uh, the, the Mrs. Faint Hearts, um, those who um, feel and see their weakness continually, even to despairing, can, can, I want you to consider the God who keeps you. That he is a mighty fortress, a bulwark never failing. There's no need to fear. If you know that the, the garrison that is protecting your city is almighty, that no one, no thing can thwart him, tear him down, penetrate his barriers, does that not cause for comfort, a security? God's people will be guarded to glory. Psalm 46, verse 7, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The Lord is our strength, and he is a saving refuge to his anointed. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. Can you, my, my beloved brothers and sisters, say with the psalmist in Psalm 18, verse 1 through 3, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Amen. Amen. God's people will be guarded all the way to glory. Now consider the third point. What is the means of this preservation? In verse five, it says that we are kept by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. It is that we are kept by the power of God through faith. The means of our preservation is faith. It, doesn't, it does not say that we are kept by the power of God apart from faith, like those who would say once saved, always saved. Right? They say, no, there's no necessity for a, a believer to continue in the faith. Once they're saved, they've always been saved. But the scripture here says that God uses the means of faith to guard, to keep, to garrison the believers. It is not apart from faith, through faith. And it's not, don't, don't miss this, it does not say that it is on account of faith. That's a, that's a whole nother heresy. It does not say that you are kept by the power of God on account of your faith. That would be the same thing. Um, uh, that it would strip the security away from the believer because if your faith is like my faith, it is like the tides of Canaveral, ever ebbing, ever flowing, up one day, down the next, strong in a moment, weak the next second. It is, not on account of our, it is not on account of our faith. It's not as if God looks down upon our faith and takes into account our faith and then keeps us according to our faithfulness. No, no, it's according to his mercy and it's through faith. Through faith. Faith is the means of our preservation. God uses faith to guard us unto glory. Well, what is faith? Is it just a simple believing of the facts? No. Is it a mere agreement with the truth? No. True saving faith does agree with the truth. True saving faith does agree with the facts. But faith is a believing that God is who he says he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
Faith is a continual trust and dependence on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved from the power and penalty of sin. Faith looks away from self and looks and fixes its gaze on Christ Jesus. True faith produces good works. It is something that fails not. Faith endures to the end because saving faith is a gracious gift of God. It's a gift that God gives for salvation and it is a gift that God sustains unto a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. John Flavel said, and this is, this is wonderful, you are going to want to use this. Faith is the empty hand of, God's, of man's need. Faith is the empty hand of man's need reaching out for the outstretched arm of God's provision. Faith is the empty hand of man's need reaching out for the outstretched arm of God's provision. And God has made provision. God has made provision in sending his only begotten son into the world, born of a woman, taking on himself the flesh, suffering and dying on the cross to pay the price for sinners, for the elect sinners, the elected rejected. We are elected in heaven, but rejected in this earth. Do you possess this type of faith? Let me stop for a moment. Do you possess this type of faith? Is your faith enduring? Is your faith fixed on Christ? Does your faith look away from yourself, seeing only enough to despair? God has been so merciful and patient to all of us. Today you have heard the inherit of the inheritance of the saints, You have heard of God's gracious guarding of souls, the necessity of faith unto salvation. Have you believed in this mighty God? Have you believed in his precious son whom he sent to be a propitiation for our sins? Have you been born again by his Holy Spirit? If not, you have your own inheritance. It's an inheritance that is not like that unto the saints. In Romans chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, it says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. The mighty God that keeps and guards the saints unto glory will guard and keep you in eternal chains of darkness suffering in inscrutable pain and flaming fires. Listen, you do have a fortress, but if you have not trusted in Christ Jesus, your fortress is not God. Listen to what Nahum says. All of your strongholds are like fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. If you are trusting in something other than Christ, all it takes is God's wind of providence to shake that fortress and it falls. Do not put your trust in anything that you see in your, in your mirror. Do not put your trust in anything that you see in this world. They will not protect you. They will not guard you. Only Christ Jesus can keep the soul. Come to him. Put your faith in him, your trust. Let him be your ever dependence, your treasure, your portion forever. So a few practical helps as we wrap up. What should we take from this, beloved? What should we take from this? Worship God in the storm. Worship God in the storm. In the darkest valley and the roughest waters of your pilgrimage, let the echoes of God's praise be heard all around. And two, comfort one another with these words. There are many Mr. Fearings. There are many 
um, Mr. Doubtings and, and the faint-hearted and come and strengthen their arms and their legs. Come, use this truth that we've learned from 1 Peter today to comfort one another. His ability, his power to do all things, his power to guard us all the way to glory. And third, go and tell the world about our great God. This is a world without hope. This is a message of hope to the hopeless. This is a message about a mighty fortress who can keep to the uttermost to a people who are trusting in paper mache. And finally, what kind of condemnation will be fit for us if we neglect so great a salvation? Let us continue to run the race set before us with endurance. Let us continue to look away from ourselves and unto our great God and his precious son, trusting in the power of his Holy Spirit to preserve us all the way to glory. Amen? Amen. God's people will be guarded all the way to glory. Let us pray. Bless you. Bless you, our Father. You deserve all of the praise and the glory we thank you for your abundant mercy. Lord, help us to look above our present circumstance to the glory that is to be revealed in the last days when you are glorified in your saints. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here that you would encourage them and strengthen their hearts and um, keep their eyes fixed on the end of the race where Jesus is ready to receive them. And I pray for those who may not know you, Lord. Undoubtedly, they're, they're, it would not be a, a far shot to, to think that there are some here who still do not believe. And I pray that you would blow upon their fortresses, that they might fall so they would have no shelter and be turned to come to your precious Son and receive everlasting life. In Christ's name. Amen.